So one of the questions that I'm always asked, and I do a lot of presentations, webinars, videos, um, active on social media, is what's the best way to get a overall assessment of the market? Um, I'm sure you saw what happened in October to December, a really significant market decline. Uh, expectations are that this is the, the move, the decline, uh, getting us almost to a 20% correction, which would be a technical bear market. But what would we look at to say that this is indeed the move that we would expect to continue? Or what would end up, as we saw, claim that this is the move that's going to stall out and once again be the buy the dip kind of mentality. So I, I thought a lot, a lot about this, I've written a lot about reports about this, and I've, I've come up with three assets that I think really personify what you can look at without getting too nitty gritty uh, and understand whether we were actually going to have that uh, bear market come, as I'm sure most of you would worry about and should worry about. I know I worry about it on a regular basis. So this was the uh, kind of basis of this uh, presentation. Of course, the disclaimer, uh, I have to say that uh, Daily FX is actually owned by IG, the new uh, FX broker in the United States, um, and we are a guaranteed IB. Uh, so you can see that disclaimer there. Uh, and also the standard hypothetical disclaimer. Um, obviously, none of this is actual trading advice. This is research. Uh, also, you have to understand that when you use leveraged products, you can lose more than your actual account, which is a standard, and everyone should appreciate money management. All right, so a little bit about me. Uh, I've actually been trading myself since I was 16. Uh, I got into this because I was very fortunate that my mother-in-law, who was not my mother at the, law at the, at the time, uh, but my mother-in-law was actually a fantastic trader. She was trading many different assets. Um, at the time, she was trading Swiss franc futures. Uh, so I just happened to get into contact with somebody who was just very, very experienced. And it was tough on me because she was not the typical trader. Uh, she was an options trader, a complex uh, multi-leg uh, uh, options trader. So I kind of learned markets backwards. I started from the really complicated stuff and got into the easier stuff, which is a tough kind of approach to the markets, but uh, I, I felt like I learned a lot. But it was when I went to college that I kind of turned things around in terms of my analysis. I, I, I learned initially technical analysis, and that's where my heart still really relies. But I got into kind of the market structure uh, appreciation. So learning more about a market, learning what the S&P 500 is, uh, how it's created, what it uses to, uh, to price derivatives, stuff like that, all in college. I uh, got a finance and investment degree. And then I joined uh, Daily FX, the FX research group, um, as an intern uh, back in 2004. And then I started getting into fundamental analysis, actually from Boris, uh, did a lot of how, <laughs> how I got into it. Um, so it was a, a big kind of backwards uh, integration into the markets. But uh, what I really focus on now, and I've gone through all these, uh, these rounds of technical analysis, fundamental analysis, market structure, and right now I find myself most interested in behavior, behavior of masses. And it's not to say that this is where everyone should look. It's just that I've done so much uh, analysis and research on these other things. I feel like I'm comfortable in these pieces. Now I need to really learn uh, the behavioral aspect, the trading psychology aspect, my own and others. And it's always part of the journey to understand where you find yourself and what pieces you find most important. So we all eventually come to the same spot that if you are in this game long enough, there's always something to learn and you will actually evolve over time. So it's important to recognize that there is no one thing that is best, especially in terms of analysis technique, but make sure that you continue to learn. All right, so what I'm trying to answer with this presentation, as I said in the beginning, I'm trying to give you an overview of the markets. Um, how can I tell if this 20, well, near 20% correction in the S&P 500 through December the 24th is a bear market or is it just a more violent correction, a temporary uh, heave of the markets that will eventually get us back into the recovery effort? All right. That's a question that we should all ask. I know I ask it uh, on a regular basis. And for most of us, it, we ask it you know, on one 2% down day. 
whether we are getting into the bear market. Uh, I would say if you're only seeing a one day 2% correction, maybe wait for a couple more days. But um, the way that I think that we can uh, go about this without having to look at too many things, I know people that will analyze you know, all the credit markets, all the financial markets, all the uh, economy, uh, economic metrics that we see across the board. You know, Daily FX has a number of Bloomberg terminals, and you can get into a deep data hole and try to establish, you know, so many different means of saying this is a market that's going up or down. And what you end up with is uh, paralysis by analysis. Too many things going on, you just don't know if I'm actually looking at something that I'm confident in because you're putting too much dependency on data that you have to make a, a, an educated guess on after, after a certain amount. So I boil it down to three markets. All right, so you don't have to get into uh, too insane. But these three markets are actually much better, I think, at uh, measuring some of the shifts. They're very common. I mean, we're going to be talking about the S&P 500, the dollar, and uh, gold. These are not, uh, you know, uh, obscure assets. They're very common. But you're starting to see from these three that they are at the crux of a lot of the changes that we're seeing in the financial market. And this is why I think they're very important to actually look at, especially together. All right, so those three markets, the S&P 500, which is the ubiquitous risk-oriented asset. You have the U.S. dollar, which we consider to be a safe haven, but it actually uh, has something of a reserve issue status, and it is a carry trade currency, which is unusual. We'll talk about that if you're not familiar with FX. And you have gold, which most of us, uh, if you don't trade gold, you assume it's, a, it's you know, the safe haven. It's, it, people move to gold when things are getting more volatile and risk-averse. Uh, but gold is actually kind of the peak of that trinity, and I'll, t I'll tell you why in a second. All right, so we'll start with the S&P 500. The S&P 500 is kind of the benchmark of risk. I, I don't think I'm alone in thinking that U.S. equities are uh, perhaps one of the best metrics of sentiment and risk. I think that it's a pretty uh, common understanding, but I'll show you kind of the data that I would uh, rely on to say that that is indeed the case. Uh, also, the S&P 500 back, is backed by the world's largest economy, which is not something to kind of shrug your shoulders at. Uh, and it, it is actually the foundation of some of the most liquid and popular assets that we see now today. And I'll show you some interesting charts for that. So first, uh, the S&P 500 as a representation of risk trends. This is a performance chart of a number of assets that I consider to be good metrics of risk trends. Uh, and I started from March the 1st, 2009. That's uh, loosely when we would say that the markets uh, started to turn up from the great financial crisis. All right. So since that point, this is, uh, well, I look at this chart all the time. But I don't even look at it. The S&P 500, you have global indices, uh, all world. Uh, you have emerging markets, high yield fixed income. You have carry trade. And I uh, throw in some commodities as well as uh, the uh, risk measure, measure that I actually uh, measure myself. If it's not proprietary. You can ask me after if you want to know what it is. Um, but you can see from that 10-year period, and actually as of, I believe it was Saturday, that's a 10-year um, recovery since we we start, saw the first big up candle back on March 8, 2009, that the S&P 500, the blue line at the top, is the best performer by far. All right. So it's, it's not just a, a, a qualification. It's not just a familiarity that the markets see this all the time. It's actually the S&P 500's performance, people plowing cash into the S&P 500 and actually lifting it. Okay. And when we think about why the S&P 500 might be more popular than others, I think it makes a lot of sense um, that it just happens to be the largest economy in the world. Now, equities are a ubiquitous asset. Uh, almost all of you probably have experience with equities if you don't outright invest or trade in them. And that's by virtue of something that's already been set into motion before you even got into this market. It was uh, decades worth of regulatory environment and decades worth of, uh, of building up compliance and regulation. It's a favorable environment for trading shares. Now, shares aren't the best market to actually trade in. In fact, you should diversify across multiple assets. But 
it's that ubiquity that makes it much more tangible for it being a good measure for the overall markets. I love this chart. This is not minus this visual capital. I wish I can make that myself. But this uh, shows that actually the U.S. Uh, GDP as of this year is estimated by the IMF to be about 21.5 billion, uh, uh, or sorry, trillion. Uh, and that's about 25% of total GDP. So that is a large economy. Think about it this way. If the U.S. were in a recession, do you think the rest of the world would be able to avoid it? Uh, almost certainly not. If the U.S. were in a recession, the rest of the world is going to get dragged down with it. So if you're looking at one index, let's say equities, because I, as I said, it's ubiquitous, then you want to look at something from the U.S. And I picked the S&P 500 over the Dow, even though for some reason the Dow is always first um, in the listings. And it's also more popular in Europe than it is uh, than the S&P 500 for some reason. The S&P 500 actually is much more used. Uh, and that's actually shown in this graph because the S&P 500 is the foundation of so many assets. All right. Do any of you trade ETFs? Yeah. All right. So. The spider ETFs, for example, SPY, is, is the most liquid ETF, all right, bar none. It, it's more liquid than not just other equity ETFs, it is the most liquid ETF. And that's a foundation and a popularity that grows uh, with what this represents. And not only that, your E-mini futures, if you're a futures trader, that's the most liquid of the futures uh, contracts, uh, at least financial. Uh, and you have the VIX, volatility index. I'm sure most of you are all familiar with the VIX. That is based on the S&P 500. The S&P 500 is at the foundation of so many things. And as you can see, ETFs here, this is actually ETFs relative to the S&P 500, the assets in ETFs have been growing and growing over time. This has become a very in vogue asset class. As the markets have risen, people don't get so concerned about picking the best stock. They get more concerned about just chasing the market, taking participation, uh, and they get exposure through the spider ETF. So the S&P 500 is a great measure of risk trends for multiple reasons, including that it is just used for most of the derivatives that we see. So people get exposure to the markets. People want to get long, they say, the market. They're getting long the S&P 500 mostly. All right. I also have a, uh, the market cap of the S&P 500 versus the S&P 500 ETF all right. growing rapidly over time. So let's look at the US dollar. Now, most of us, if you have any experience with the US dollar, you probably trade the dollar as one of the two currencies and the crosses that you trade. I mean, it's the most uh, common. The U.S. dollar, again backed by the U.S. economy, is often and most often considered a safe haven. But it is uh, very unique, especially over the past five years, because it's actually become the top carry currency of the majors, which is a really unique situation and why the dollar needs to be watched much more closely and much more carefully. But we also have a very uh, systemic influence. And for those that uh, traded or uh, at least lived through uh, the financial crisis, you would recognize that the US dollar has also been significantly skewed um, from the global perspective as it represents uh, the reserve currency of the world. It is uh, the primary pricing instrument, which you see through commodities. And this role makes it a very central figure in the health of the financial system. Not just a risk on, risk off appetite, but it's the intensity of that risk on, risk off appetite, which I find most important for the US dollar. OK. So we'll start actually with what we usually consider to be a, an important thing for the US dollar, an important role. And it is as a safe haven. All right. So, when you measure risk, when you would actually want to save haven, what's the most uh, common measure that we see, let's say on CNBC or Bloomberg? It would be the VIX. At least that's the one that I pick up on. Um, you can look at any measure, but the VIX is the one that I think is uh, most familiar. Here it is, the dollar index, the ICE's dollar index versus the VIX. And I went back to 2001 uh, to just give a good representation. Yes, in the peaks you do have with the surge in volatility or uncertainty, fear, that the dollar does rise. Uh, but you see a very different kind of performance from the US dollar, especially over the past uh, four or five years. And that change comes because of, and this is where this becomes a more important indicator, uh, the fact that the US dollar actually is backed by the highest benchmark interest rate. 
So the U.S. benchmark interest rate is, uh, well, it's a range of 2.25 to 2.5, or 2.25 to 2.5, and it's uh, so thereby 2.375 on average. Relative to all of its other majors, uh, the high credit quality liquid currencies, it is the highest yielding or returned asset. So with the U.S. dollar, people actually pursue it for higher return which is unusual and exactly the opposite of what you'd expect if you were talking about the dollar being a safe haven. That is kind of the contradiction to a safe haven currency. But this gives it very important nuance. If you are seeing risk aversion, and as we've seen actually after the October to December decline, the U.S. dollar started to uh, falter. It didn't rise very rapidly as people would expect if it were a safe haven. In fact, it kind of just puttered along. And we have a very, very narrow range on that currency. And that's largely because this also saw the Fed interest rate forecast, which I'm sure you're also familiar with, regardless of what asset class you're in, dropped dramatically from expecting three, maybe four rate hikes in 2019 to now debating whether there's even going to be one. In fact, now they're starting to talk about the probability of a rate cut. So it's very, uh, a very significant reversal in term. So the U.S. Uh, benchmark interest rate now makes it a kind of a high dividend uh, commodity or a high dividend stock, if you will, in the FX market. And that does make for a very significant shift in how this currency normally acts. And that can be exploited when you're looking to assess whether I'm looking at risk aversion, a genuine risk aversion, or a significant risk aversion or not. Do a time check, make sure I'm not going too long. All right. uh, so the U.S. dollar, as you see here, uh, just to demystify this chart, this is actually accounting for the percentage of usage on currencies amongst the majors. All right. The most liquid is that top line, the S&P 500, or sorry, the, the, the dollar, which represents about 64% of total currency transactions in the world. Uh, the next closest is actually down there, the euro. It's just above 20. That's a significant gap. All right. Being the world's most liquid currency means this currency is always going to be at the center of changes in the financial system. And that includes things like risk trends. Risk on, risk off, the dollar is going to be a part of one way or the other. You can imagine if there is a financial crisis that most of the capital will shift back to the U.S. dollar, largely because a lot of the aggregate wealth in the world as being the largest economy comes back. It's repatriated. But also when people are looking for liquidity, um, which is the safeguard or the lifeblood of protecting your capital, you actually will see it come back to the U.S. dollar. Let's just uh, hold off on questions. Uh, I want to make sure I get to the end, um, but remember it and we'll, I'll take you first, okay? Um, this will represent a currency that when we do have a full tilt risk aversion, people are panicking, you would expect this currency to rise. And this is a very important nuance because if I'm talking about, say, mild risk aversion, as we've seen, as the U.S. dollar becomes the carry currency or high dividend stock of the FX world, people will actually sell it first because people have built up an exposure, a, a, a long interest in the currency as uh, the heyday years of the past decade of risk on have actually encouraged people to invest into the U.S. dollar, U.S. assets, whether it be treasuries or whether it be Apple shares. They're trying to get higher rates of return because this is where they can find it. So the first thing you do in risk aversion is to actually sell these high return assets, these risky assets, which is why I get in a lot of debates with people about why the Japanese yen is not a better safe haven than the U.S. dollar. It just looks that way sometimes. So the U.S. dollar being the most liquid currency in the world actually sets it to be a perfect uh, measure of extreme risk aversion. All right. Now, this is another fairly related currency. This is actually the uh, Bank for International Settlements uh, triennial report, which means every three years they update this and tell you uh, how much uh, currency is actually traded. Um, now, this actually adds up to over 100%, and this is actually notional, but uh, there's two currencies per every cur cross. So if you see the percentage version of this, it should add up to 200. But the blue line is total. The red line, oops. Oh. The red line is actually, oh my, there we go. The, the red line is actually the U.S. dollar, okay? So it actually 
total should be only be the aggregation of all the uh, times two. Uh, but this is a representation of the U.S. dollar as a relative to all the other currencies, the euro, the pound, the yen. If you trade currency, you should rep recognize all these currencies. This is weird. There we go. Something wrong with this? Yeah, it gets very wonky. Ah. Okay. There we go. So, I'll just put that down there. Um, so, the U.S. dollar, when you're trying to get away from, let's say, the euro, the pound, or the yen, or if you ever trade at the, the Chinese yuan, you're most likely going to go to the U.S. dollar. And that's by virtue of this being the most likely currency that you're going to find a market where it's not moving rapidly against you. Now, I know in our modern FX markets um, that it's, um, it's a world where we think that there's always going to be a market. But we got to think in terms of like banks who don't trade um, the scale of leverage that we are consider. They actually trade cash or notional value. Uh, and they do need to move their markets such that there's not a rapid movement. All right. So to get into these markets to get away, especially from something like the euro or the pound, the pound with Brexit, um, if you need to get away from the pound, where do you go? You can go to the euro or the U.S. dollar, especially if you're in a panic. You can't think really, uh, especially if you're a bank, and you're not just stopping in currency. You're, you need to go into other assets, whether that be treasuries or what have you. You need to think about where is going, there going to be more of a market that can absorb all my money. All right. Where can I put my cash and I'm not going to lose all my capital? And you have to go up in the scale of liquidity. And that means you have to go up in the scale to the US dollar. All right, so it is an ultimate safe haven by virtue of its use, its, 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 uh, its familiarity in the market, and the fact that it backs everything. It's also a pricing instrument. All right, you're talking about a currency that we price oil in. Whether, it doesn't matter whether you're talking about WTI, West Texas Intermediate, which is our US standard, or you're talking about the Brent crude oil contract, the UK standard or European standard, the price in dollars. All right? Most assets around the world are priced in dollars one way or the other. So it's, it's a fixture of our markets, and we can't get away from it for that reason. All right? So that also means that the US dollar is now going to be, it's a, it's a must currency. Capital has to flow through it one way or the other. But we don't know if it's going to be necessarily a safe haven, because that's what its standard role is. We know that its liquidity makes it very, very attractive. But we also know that it now has a high yield. It has the highest yield of all the majors. So maybe it's a carry currency. I'm not saying there's a lot of people who are going long carry trade right now, because there's terrible carry. But you have this kind of balance. If I were to expect, let's say, that risk aversion were only mild, I would expect that the US dollar would actually drop, mild to moderate. Why? Because people are actually unwinding carry trade. Because in mild uh, to moderate level of risk aversion, we actually have a need to unwind carry trade, to get out of these low yielding assets that we've just been chasing because we need whatever return we can find. But if it gets to a severe level, uh, full tilt risk aversion. Then all we care about is liquidity. All I care about is I want something to safeguard my assets. I need to put my money somewhere where I don't have to worry about it and I have high credit quality. And that means the dollar will sh uh, surge higher if I have extreme risk aversion. So what I didn't see in October through December is the kind of move that would really push people towards the US dollar or treasuries in a very significant way. Now there's a little bit of a uh, a caveat here into uh, treasuries, but I won't go into that arcana because I said I wouldn't go there. But gold will be the, the, the round out for this. It will give us the good uh, composition that we, we would want with these two other factors between the dollar and the S&P 500. All right, so put that back down. Gold, uh, most of you are familiar with gold. One way or the other, regardless if you trade it or not, you, you know how it's treated on the, the global stage. It is usually a safe haven, all right? But it is a, a very flawed safe haven. Uh, I had the um, benefit of actually learning a lot about futures when I was in college, uh, but uh, I've only traded gold uh, moderately in my career. 
gold, however, is not really a, a true safe haven. We, we consider it a safe haven for certain things. So inflation hedge, for example. When people say inflation is going to shoot through the roof, what does that mean to the currency? The currency is going to depreciate. All right? You can buy fewer things with the same amount of cash because the cost of those things rise. How do I stop my money from losing value? I get into gold. But very, very few people actually invest in gold for that reason. One of the big things that, uh, that's a detriment to gold is that it has no yield. So if I actually do have inflation, I'm sitting in gold, and it's not inflation enough to offset my income, I don't want to get too wonky, but you, you'll actually lose money in your account over time. All right? And that's a severe issue that people don't really appreciate, I think, when it comes to gold as a traditional safe haven. Um, but if push comes to shove, if the markets do have this uh, severe move, severe uh, aversion to being exposed to the standard markets, then yes, they will go to gold as a safety uh, feature all right? because of just habit. All right? This is especially true of Europe and Asia where people are much more confident there in this, this metal than they are of the own financial assets that, let's say, uh, are backed by their standard central banks or governments because they're not confident in the central banks or governments. But what really interests me about gold and why I think it needs to be part of the Trinity is the fact that it played a very unique role, and we saw that role very explicitly between 2008 and 2011. Was anybody looking at gold during that time frame? Just curious. Uh, yeah. Gold shot higher, almost $1,900 an ounce. And it was already on the back of an of a existent bull trend, but this was an enormous rally to record highs. What would motivate a safe haven to shoot that high during 2008 to 2011 when the markets were already turning around, improving, you weren't having risk aversion. So something else is motivating it and motivating it in the kind of way that would amplify it to that degree. It was, well, it was stimulus. It was central banks and essentially the devaluation of money. There was no other asset to really look at, including the US dollar. So let's take a look at a couple of charts here. Gold as an inflation hedge. This is US CPI year over year versus uh, gold prices. Yes, I guess you have some correlation there loosely or roughly, uh, but it is a, a relatively poor uh, correlation uh, between gold and inflation over time, even if you offset or even if you do a, a moving average of the metal. Okay. Much more important is gold as a safe haven. And during the safe haven move of 2008, uh, gold did start to recover some of its traction, although very clearly it had a significant short-term deviation during some of the uh, TARP and TALF uh, efforts. That's the, that's the precursor to the QE programs that we know now. Um, and it still acts as a safe haven, but again, only under unique circumstances. People are much more, they're connoisseurs of their safe havens. After a decade uh, or 15 years of extreme volatility and then seeming, uh, you know, uh, markets where everything seems to go right and we can't pick a wrong asset because it's a buyer's market, people have become much more uh, definitive on what kind of assets they like for safety, what kind of assets they like for higher return. All right. So it is not just a, uh, a, a one-size-fits-all kind of safe haven. But really, the appeal of gold comes in this monetary policy environment. And this one's a little bit more complicated of a theme because it, you know, usually when I talk about this, I, I go through like a, a dozen charts. But I think this one represents it very well. This is gold versus the total stimulus of the Fed, the ECB, the Bank of Japan, the Bank of England, and the People's Bank of China. All right, five of the largest central banks in the world. Collectively, their stimulus accounts for over $20 trillion equivalent. All right. What does that mean? It means that they're pumping all this cash into the system to try to ensure that kind of confidence in growth, confidence in speculative appetite. And it's worked uh, to a point. I think the last five years were probably unnecessary. And in fact, they are probably detrimental because it's led to a sense of what we call moral hazard. People are much more confident, overconfident than they really should be. But you have this kind of drive of uh, 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 an exposure to carry, uh, or sorry, exposure to, um, uh, to risk, of, uh, risk appetite. 
and people really don't have the rate of return that they would expect. You don't have the, f the fundamentals that I would expect. If I have a really strong market, I, I look at really robust growth, really high rates of return, we don't have all that. We just have, for some reason, capital gains. So uh, the S&P 500 and that, as they say, buy the dip mentality, or the, the ruder version with the F in it. But this is a, a mentality that's been driven by gold, or sorry, by stimulus. A and gold is kind of the offset to a depreciation of the currencies. Because as stimulus rises, as all this, these funds go into the system, people start to question, all right, we're coming to the end of the cycle. And I, I definitely would say that we're at the end of our, our cycle, our market cycle. Uh, not, you know, it's not going to crash tomorrow, but it, you're definitely in the flagging stages. And what do we have to rely on? Have you ever thought, all right, if we had a, let's say, a market financial crisis tomorrow, what would I expect from my markets? Uh, a lot of people still say, I, I expect the central banks to step in and stabilize the system. With what? With what? They're already $20 trillion in the hole. They don't really have any kind of uh, safety net for which they can prevent any of these high-level crises in the future. So we have what ends up being actually a depreciation of stability. All, right, all this QE pumped into the system devalues also currencies, but it really erodes confidence in uh, what the backstop is for the financial system. So if you have, let's say, for example, risk aversion, which has to prompt central banks to step in, because God forbid we have to rely on the governments to work together, because that's not going to happen to help stabilize the markets, then the central banks are going to essentially make very clear very quickly that they are out of, uh, out of ammunition. They have no recourse. Uh, they've already gone into QE. They've already essentially cut rates to a, a zero or the equivalent of zero. And there's really no other uh, ability to do anything else with that. So what's in, going to end up happening, they're going to continue to do whatever they can, probably more QE like the Bank of Japan and the ECB with the TLTRO. Uh, and you're going to see currencies depreciate. And you're going to see risk aversion. So the S&P 5 is going to drop. But where are safe havens, uh, where are safe havens going to be found if people are uh, frightening, frightened of the US dollar at that point? They're going to probably find it in something like gold, which is an alternative to traditional currency. All right? Gold has been around for millennia. It will be around for millennia. Uh, and it is used for money for all that time. It will continue to be used for money at all that time. Now, I'm not a big you know, gold-only advocate. I'm not a gold bug. But it very much fits our conditions now when we talk about a world of stimulus and we talk about a world of central banks and uh, kind of the support that they gave and then the, unexpected re uh, the unrealistic expectations they've created into the, into the current condition. I know that's the hardest one. Uh, so let's put them all together. All right, how much time do I have? I want to make sure I get some questions. Uh, what kind of uh, markets would, or what would I expect between these three? If I were looking at a, a, a risk aversion, what would I see from these three assets? Well, in, or sorry, risk appetite first. Risk appetite, I expect the S&P 500 to rise. It's if people are putting their money into something with a higher uh, or with a expected continuation, a 10-year bull trend, that's the S&P 500. It's, it's, it, that makes sense. That's the easy one. But what would happen to the US dollar? It's not a safe haven in this case. It would actually advance. It would rise because it is a higher yielding currency right now. And if you saw that conditions improved in the backdrop, the economy improved, the rate of return improved, then Fed expectations would rise as well. So the, if you expect people to continue to chase carry trade, or if you want to look at it, because I know carry trade for non-FX traders is complicated, if you were expecting to chase dividends, a dividend on the carry, uh, then you would expect to go long the dollar. All right, so the dollar would actually rise. It wouldn't play the safe haven. It would play a high return currency. And gold would probably drop. Because who wants to be in gold with no yield? It offers no rate of return when everything else is being prized just for whatever additional yield I can find. And this is the kind of environment where people aren't even willing to buy a hedge. This is why volatility has been so low through periods over the past three or four years. People aren't even willing to pay the, the really absurdly cheap cost of hedging their exposure, long S&P 500, with a little bit of, let's say, options, a little bit of, uh, of offset. 
because it's too expensive, which is ludicrous. That's, that's the kind of exposure and risk on mentality that we currently have in these markets. So on the opposite end, what would I expect in risk aversion? Well, in risk aversion, there's moderate and there's intense. And in moderate risk aversion, I would expect that, yes, the S&P 500 would drop. That makes sense. All right. But moderate risk aversion, I expect the dollar to actually decline. Even though I know we consider it a safe haven, it's not a safe haven in these cases because the, f the outlook for yield for the U.S. dollar would continue to drop. And it has the most room to drop. All right. Relative to, if you're an FX trader, you saw the Aussie and the Kiwi, they've not been tracing out risk trends recently at all. The dollar has because it's being treated as a carry currency. All right. And what would I expect from uh, gold and moderate level risk aversion? It would rise. It would rise because it is actually a safe haven in which um, you are seeing as the dollar declines, as yields decline, the appeal of gold will start to rise. But intense risk aversion, you know, we're talking about extreme risk aversion, S&P 500 obviously would drop. Gold would rise because it would be considered a safe haven, and at that point, people are just kind of blind by panic. They'll go into things, especially in Asia and Europe, where they're more comfortable with uh, safety in the precious metal. But the dollar would surge because at that point, people don't care. All they care about is liquidity. I need to put my money somewhere where I don't think that I'm going to lose it, whether it be because of a government, because of a central bank, or because the market that I'm in, or the, the, the financial system I'm in, crashes. And that means the U.S. That means the U.S. dollar. And most people don't stop at U.S. dollars. They stop in money markets and they stop in treasuries. All right. So you, that's kind of the extreme risk aversion. Dollar is really the moving piece in that trinity. Not gold. Uh, not gold. Um, gold is a, a specific caveat here. So. What if, uh, here's a couple of scenarios, and I'll, I'll brush by the, the first three because they essentially talk about those um, aspects. But the, scenario, the subsequent three scenarios. What if the S&P 500 and the dollar fall, but gold rises? That is risk aversion, without doubt. But gold will rise because people are concerned about uh, that scenario of fiat problems. So essentially, when the central banks have to step up because everything is crashing, all right, we need somebody to save us. And, you know, I expect the Fed, the ECB, and the Bank of Japan to do it like they did back in uh, 2008, 2009. Well, at that point, people would recognize probably that the central banks don't have that capacity anymore. And you're going to see that gold will rise because the currencies will rapidly devalue. That is confidence in those currencies dropping aggressively, especially when people realize they don't have any room for stimulus. There's no way. So that is the case where gold will actually rise as the, the ultimate safe haven. But if you're talking about the S&P 500 and gold dropping, whereas the dollar is rising, that's a situation in which all we are looking for is liquidity. Gold does not have the liquidity that the US dollar has. I know gold has seen people kind of, uh, they dramatize it, they make it look really, really um, bigger than it is. It doesn't have the liquidity that the US dollar has. Now, it's a tangible metal, and there's good arguments made there, but the U.S. dollar and the backing that it has is, and it's, it's fungible, it can be, a, a, you can trade your shares for the U.S. dollar, you can't necessarily trade it for gold. You can move it into treasuries, you can move U.S. dollar over to anything. That's not true of gold. So when you're looking for liquidity, that is liquidity. That would be the liquidity scenario. But if you have uh, a dollar and gold dropping, but the S&P 500 rising, that would be unusual circumstance, but it actually comes on a very obvious outcome and it would be very actually temporary because the world just mounted a big effort and tried to dump in stimulus. You'd have central banks do whatever they can, a little bit more QE, uh, maybe go to negative rates. You might have the governments actually moving and working together in a collaborative effort to pour in some fiscal stimulus. And that would give a temporary lift to, uh, to speculative assets. It would devalue the US dollar and pretty much all currencies. Uh, but it would also mean a move away from gold because people are actually saying, well, now it's the time to take advantage of the central banks and the governments pumping cash in. So essentially, I'm trying to front run a central bank or front run a government. That's what happened um, with the S&P 500 in the early phases of the recovery after the TARP, TALF, and QE programs. So that would be the world stimulus scenario. But I would not gain any kind of confidence in that third scenario, because that would be one that does not last. 
Okay. All right, the risk disclaimer and questions, uh, if you have any. I don't know how much time I have. Probably not much. Six minutes. So, yes, yes, you were first. Yes. All right, so the question was, how does the euro, euro yen exchange rate? Okay, euro dollar is also a futures contract, but um, euro yen as a risk on risk off, it's, it's decent, but it doesn't compare to the US dollar. Now, the yen is considered a safe haven by some people, but I don't think it qualifies quite as readily. Um, when you have risk aversion, if you actually pull, uh, I don't have charts to pull up, but if you have, let's say, a drop in the S&P 500, normally you do have Euro Yen, Pound Yen, Aussie Yen, they all drop. And the reason is what I talked about earlier is people are on winding carry trade. So if you were trading FX before 10 years ago, uh, you would have seen people are much more uh, interested in going long, let's say, Aussie Yen because we actually had rates of return back then uh, per annum that were about 7%. 7% extra, obviously adding a little leverage to that, that can be quite substantial. So there was something to talk about back then in carry trade. We don't have a lot of carry trade now. Um, and that is a very important aspect because people didn't really build up long carry trade uh, into the past decade because there really wasn't any to be had. So people weren't short yen to actually take advantage of the long carry. So when you have risk aversion, people first unwind their long risk trades. And then, as it gets more intense, they get into the, the severity of, oh no, I'm panicking. Where do I actually park my money? People don't park in Japan. Um, Japan has a host of problems. One of them is uh, just onset disinflation, deflation. They've been dealing with decades. Uh, they have, and that's a holdover from the savings and loan crisis. They, the Bank of Japan continues to pump in QE, and it's actually devaluing their currency. Um, no one really wants to put their money into Japan if we get to the point of another financial crisis because it will actually destabilize confidence in the Japanese uh, government and the Japanese central bank. The U.S., it has its own problems, but it's very far from that because it's not as extremely exposed as the Bank of Japan. Can I have one more question? Sure. Uh, I've also heard recently that uh, the U.S. dollar, Euro-U.S. dollar trade is perhaps the most fundamental trade of all the currencies. Is that true? And can you give, direct, uh, give, a, uh, give us a look into the, the other four? Yeah, I would say that it is one of the most, so the question was, uh, it, the Euro USD is it one of the most fundamentally indicative, uh, yeah, is it the, bi the big one? Um, the Euro USD is quite significant in terms of what it means to most other asset classes. Um, it, it is the most liquid currency, or actually liquid trade or asset in the world. Uh, but it also happens to be an intersection of so many issues. Uh, liquidity, they're the two most liquid currencies, but both being extremely liquid, it means kind of like a, a nuanced trade. So versus, let's say, the euro or the yen, that's less nuanced. The euro and the USD is very nuanced. Do I want the, the currency that represents the most or the second most liquidity? It also happens to represent monetary policy the ECB's monetary policy versus the Fed's monetary policy, which there's a lot of speculative integration in there. Two largest economies in the world, and they're very similar. They're both developed world behemoths. The Euro is actually, uh, is, or the Eurozone is slightly smaller than the US, uh, but very, very close. Um, so it, yeah, it, it's a fundamentally packed currency cross, but it's not gonna be very indicative from a risk on, risk off perspective. It's a little too complicated because it doesn't even know which theme it's following. Now, let's say that Euro USD were to plunge, um, that it's, it, it's got, it got quite close at 112. Um, if it were to plunge below that 112 level, which is actually the 61.8 fib of the historical range of the Euro since its inception, uh, then that can be indicative of just the central bank, the ECB going way overboard and devaluing its currency uh, to extreme levels or more likely could be an appetite for extreme liquidity. So it's that demand for the US dollar is the most liquid asset kind of theme. Uh, 
So it, it's, it's packed uh, currency cross, but it is not, I think, the, uh, the most easy to understand from a risk on, risk off perspective. Any other questions? Yes. So the SDR, uh, Special Drawing Rights for the IMF, is essentially a basket of currencies. And that also includes the yuan, um, which is a big factor for the future. Um, the thing is, the SDR has been something that they've been trying to transition to for 20 plus years. And they've been very unsuccessful. Um, the problem is, when you give a central bank the ability to um, diversify, where it's going to go? If you get into the SDR, you're essentially saying, IMF, take it away. And central banks don't like that because they don't know what their individual exposure is. If I'm trying to buy a fixed basket of SDR, it, for anybody that's an options trader, you can't you can't like delta hedge that. You don't you don't know exactly um, if I'm getting what offsets my trade. So if I'm Japan, I trade the most with the United States. I trade uh, second most with China, and so on and so forth. My SDR does not represent that mix very well. So it. It's essentially a loss of your ability to hedge. And central banks are not really keen on that. So, so the prediction I've heard from some that it's going to become a confidence uh, crisis in the fiat currency. And uh, like you were saying, the um, central banks don't have clean drying powder, don't have clean balance sheets. IMF is the only clean balance sheet large enough to deal with the loss of confidence. Yeah. Yeah. The SDR, if push comes to shove and people start to really question the U.S. dollar, um, it will gain in popularity. But it will it'll take a long, like uh, the um, chart that I showed with uh, the variety of currencies is the most liquid in the world. The SDR doesn't even register. It's not even a fraction of percent. Um, it would take a lot to get it to that. And you're right, there is a crisis of confidence in most currencies, especially uh, they really shot themselves in the foot the past four or five years. They didn't need to go further into QE, and they did anyways, essentially leaving themselves no room to maneuver. Uh, but going to something that's been untested is probably not what we're going to do. In the, in the height of crisis and panic, um, I know a lot of people in the financial industry, um, hedge funds and, and uh, central banks and, and, and corporate banks, they know, because they all went to the same schools that I went to, that you go to U.S. dollars, you go to U.S. treasuries, you go to U.S. Mar money markets. You don't question, you do it because your risk manager is over there screaming at you. Um, once you have time to think, then you say, all right, now what do we do? Now, now how do we you know, position capital to continue to operate our businesses? And then you start to think about alternatives, but SDR is still going to be unproven at that point. So e at the point of greatest tension, when people would you know, value the SDR the most, that's when they're probably not going to even consider it. Because panic induces behavior. So our fight or flight response, their flight response in the financial system is go to US Treasuries, US dollars. So uh, it could create more, cra uh, more problems in the end, but that's kind of the, that's the, the system and the behavioral aspect that I talked about in the beginning, why I'm trying to learn more about this, especially on the masses uh, basis, because it can create a lot of problems. But in problems uh, come opportunities. If you know where people are going to go, you take advantage, which feels, it feels bad after the fact. It feels good when your account's going up, you know, when you're taking advantage of the crisis, shorting, shorting the panic kind of thing. Any other questions? I think I'm pretty close to out of time, but... Any others? All right, well, if you have any other questions you ask me individually, I'll be over at the, uh, the Daily FX IG booth. Okay? Thank you. Thank you.